Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Mike Mayhew, Vice President of Product Development at GoToGroup. As today's host, I'd like to welcome you to the GoToGroup webinar series. Today, I will be joined by my guest, guest Greg Geraci of Actuation, Actuation Consulting to cover the topic, Is Agile Adoption Losing Steam? It's based on the annual survey, the study of product team performance, a global worldwide study of product teams that's been conducted since 2012, uh, which is now in its fourth year. I will introduce our featured guest in detail in just a minute. Uh, however, first I want to say a little bit uh, about my background and how it relates to today's topic. As I mentioned, I'm Mike Mayhew, GoTo Group uh, Vice President of Product Development. I've been coding for the last 16 years and have an extensive background in uh, enterprise Java development. More importantly, I've been evangelizing clean code and best coding practice or best practices, uh, best coding practices since the early 2000s. My first speaking engagement was in 2001 at the JSIG conference, uh, where I spoke about the MVC design pattern uh, early in the early days. Recently, I've presented uh, with Atlassian at the Getting Get Right events, and I've also taught uh, taught classes at the Atlassian Summit last year. First, a little bit about GoTo Group. Um, we're experts uh, in all flavors of application lifecycle management. Um, founded in 2002. Uh, we have offices and customers worldwide uh, for government buyers. Uh, we're on the JSA schedule, um, and uh, we basically help uh, medium to large companies improve their uh, tooling around ALM and also uh, their development uh, as a whole, improving their process, tools, and, and workflow. Um, some of the uh, go-to group services. Um, we provide professional services around, um, again, ALM, uh, software development best practices. Uh, some of our clients and partners uh, are HP, Perforce, and IBM. We also use um, MuleSoft, and we're partners with MuleSoft because it basically uh, provides the service bus and backend for our product ConnectAll, uh, which is an integration tool that allows connectivity between other ALM tools. So we're our pretty much all about uh, connecting uh, tooling uh, around software development all the way from requirements to delivery. And some of our customers, you can see here, we've got quite a few. Um, these are some of the larger customers. We've got, you know, small, medium, and large customers. And uh, the, the types of things that we do span across, you know, banking and finance and uh, food, the food industry, and even all the way up to NASA and some other uh, uh, aeronautical type companies, including the government as we're GSA. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our featured speaker, um, our guest, Greg Geraci. Uh, a little bit about Greg. He's president uh, of a company called Actuation Consulting. They're, they are a global product management consulting and training organization. Um, they function uh, with leading organizations worldwide. He's an adjunct professor. In fact, he is one of the only professors to teach uh, product management uh, to undergraduates uh, in the entire U U.S. In addition, he's the author of two books on the subject of product management. Uh, this first one is Take Charge Product Management, was his first book, and, and is geared towards those stepping into the field uh, uh, for the very first time. And the second is the Product Management and Marketing Body of Knowledge, which uh, was done with Steve Eppinger, Eppinger uh, of MIT University. Uh, thus, affiliation with MIT and its uh, work effort uh, by 60 of the leading uh, thought leaders within the global product management and marketing community to codify uh, a common body of knowledge for the product management profession. I first came to know about Greg and use him as a resource when I was writing a blog post on various product development methodologies Downloading his previous report, uh, I was amazed at his insight, and I knew uh, when he when it came out um, uh, with the latest results, I had to have him on uh, for webinars. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Greg and and let him uh, go go forward here. Thanks very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and your audience. And uh, I'd like to begin by talking about today's agenda. So today's webcast is broken into 
component pieces. The first is really demographics, if you will. So who took part in the study? So who are the survey respondents for our 2015 survey? The second section looks closely at product development methodologies. We've been tracking them for the last four years uh, and have developed a trend line that we'll share with you relative to adoption rates for each of the primary product development methodologies that are in use today. Uh, not only will we look at adoption, but we'll also look at profitability, uh, perceptions of how uh, product team members actually perceive the profitability of each of the various methodologies uh, with one clear winner. And then finally, we'll wrap up with uh, three different, uh, four different um, components that came out of our regression analysis this year. Uh, and these are the key findings that we publish each year. These factors are highly correlated to high performance on product teams. And I'll share with you the latest findings from our uh, ongoing research in this area. Uh, the 2015 study is illustrated here. At the very end, I'll give you a link so that if you're interested, you can download the study. But our study of product team performance has been going on since 2012, and this is a copy of our latest research. So um, as I mentioned a couple earlier uh, seconds earlier, we're really trying to get at through this webinar, what are the factors that drive high performance? And in particular, how, what is the role of product development methodologies as well as their perceptions of profitability? So let's begin by looking a little bit at the demographics in order to set some context so that you can understand who responded to the survey. Uh, first of all, all of our sponsors and promotional partners are email a, a web-based survey, and I'll show you in a few minutes some of our um, uh, promotional sponsors and uh, partners as well uh, so that you have an understanding of who they are. So that's on the next slide. All of the responses are anonymous, uh, but there is an optional disclosure capability, and the reason why somebody might not want to remain anonymous is when we publish the study, uh, the survey instrument, we give people the opportunity to be the first ones to actually get a copy of the white paper, but to do that we obviously need their contact information. And we also provide them with an opportunity to participate in future surveys. And we now have a pretty robust database of people who uh, participate on an annual basis, as well as new people who join every year. Um, and the people that we're most interested in hearing from are people who are actively involved in product development and so are working on product teams or leading product teams, either from an executive or a manager standpoint. And I'll show you the mix on that in a minute. But some of the roles uh, that, that we hear most commonly from are business analysts, development managers, engineers, product managers and owners, program managers and uh, project managers, as well as user experience professionals. I must say um, the user experience group is the one that we have the most difficulty actually engaging, although we try each year to try to raise that number. So we, we, if you're out there and you're listening, we'd love to have you participate in next year's survey. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the survey sponsors and partners are listed here. Our uh, sponsors this year were Sensor 6, uh, all about prioritizing the backlog, and Project Connections, where um, basically enabling project managers to be more effective. And our promotional partners span a wide array of different groups, from the Boston Product Management, as well as the Chicago Product Management Association, to the International Project Management Association, and the Software and Information Industry Association. PDMA, a large organization, also helps support our efforts, particularly the Chicago chapter, and uh, the Orange County Product Managers. <clears throat> From a demographic standpoint, let's do a little bit deeper dive and look at who exactly responded to this year's survey. First of all, 92% of respondents play an active role in creating or enhancing products or services within their organizations, and this number typically ranges between 92 and 94% each year. So once again, right within the sweet spot. Um, in terms of who specifically, what roles are actively involved in this, you'll notice that um, project managers, the bottom left-hand slice of the pie, as well as program managers, sort of the purpley color, make up about 34, almost 35% of the total responses, which is an increase from what we traditionally have. Usually it's a little bit less than this. In fact, uh, the next largest group, product managers, typically are um, the, the most robust responders, and this year we have 19.4%. <coughs> 
Additionally, if we take a look closely at engineering and development managers, they come in at about 17.3%, business analysts at 8%, and then user experience and brand managers sort of round out um, the rest at 1.9 for user experience and 1.3 for brand managers. Those are the two groups that typically we have the lowest response rates from. And product owners come in at 2.3% as well. So we have a very good representation, a very hefty response from project and program managers and thanks in large part to our sponsor, uh, Project Connections, who helped beef up the numbers this year, and we always have a very good response from product managers. So all in all, a very representative slice of the pie. In terms of um, titles that, that our survey respondents report into, we ask this question each year as well, and what you'll notice is, is that the largest slice of the pie this year is managers, so people uh, who report into managers, followed closely by directors at 28.1%, a company officer at 17.3%, a vice president in, at 14.1%, and other at 9.5%. So in essence, 60% of respondents report to a company officer, a VP, or a director. So it tilts more towards the, um, the leadership side of the equation in terms of um, you know, functional leadership. When we asked about what best describes your organization's primary business focus, three areas really stood out. 43% of survey respondents work in the technology industry, be it software or hardware. Another 24% work in the service industry. And then finally, 10% work in consumer products. There were two other groups that we hear from as well that round out the numbers, and those are government and education. But much again, much lower numbers. From a company size standpoint, in terms of annual revenues, uh, it's pretty much what you would expect to see. About a third of organizations are less than $50 million in revenue, so either startup or scale-up size kind of organizations. 40% of survey respondents report into organizations with $50 million to $2 billion in annualized revenue, so that's the bulk, if you will, of the, um, the curve, and then 27% to um, re report into organizations of over $2 billion. So once again, a really nice distribution. And very common, this is very similar to what we see year over year. So with that, let's, with the demographics aspect behind us, let's now turn our focus more towards product team dynamics. So specifically, what did survey respondents tell us about their product teams? Well, one of the things they told us when we asked this question is, which of the following best describes the effectiveness of your product team? And what you see here is that 47% uh, of survey respondents say that we deliver value but don't do it consistently. Um, this is typically the largest response um, each year that we've asked this since 2012. Uh, You'll, if you look to the left, you'll see it says, we deliver value consistently on scope, schedule, and cost, and almost 39% of survey respondents fall into that category. 11.2% say that we're hit or miss, so very inconsistent in our execution, and 2.8% say we miss more than we hit. So there's a little bit of um, historical information that I'd like to put on the table to maybe add a little insight into this. If you look at the bottom left-hand side of, of the statistical tiers, if you will, with 2012, you'll see that when we asked this question back in the heart of the recession, the Great Recession, only 13% of organizations actually indicated that they were able to deliver value um, in a consistent fashion. So, you know, in other words, we deliver value consistently on scope, schedule, and cost. Back in 2012, that number was low, uh, very low, in fact. When you took a look at 2013, we asked the same question again. It rose by eight points, up to 21%. And in 2014, it rose to 33%. In fact, this year, at 38.7, we rounded it to 39%. It's the single highest year that we've had a number of organizations responding, saying that they are consistently delivering value on scope, schedule, and cost. So, our conclusion in terms of looking at this from a historical perspective is that this trend appears to be highly correlated to positive changes in the economy and staffing levels. So if we reflect back for a second to 2012, we were in the heart of the Great Recession and um, hiring had been frozen in a lot of organizations, layoffs were going on. And so the bottom line is we believe that um, as new team members have been added to the mix and that you know staffing ratios have improved, 
as well as layoffs have decreased, um, you know, it's led to improving response rates uh, to this particular question, and we're currently at the highest level that we've ever seen. The next question has to do with product development methodologies, and each year since 2012, we've asked which of the following methodologies best describes the way your organization develops products. And as you can see here, um, in terms of blended methodologies, oop, at 43%, uh, that's the dominant response this year. So 43% of survey respondents said that they were using some combination of waterfall and agile otherwise known as a blended methodology. And coming in close second, but uh, still a little bit far back at 26% approximately, 25.7, was Agile Scrum. And the reason why it says Agile Scrum is in previous surveys we've asked which of the Agile methodologies do organizations use, and it turned out that about 93% of organizations that were using Agile methodologies were utilizing Scrum. So we know that Scrum is by far the most dominant um, iterative incremental uh, methodology currently in practice. Uh, so at 26% Agile Scrum. And then following that at 13.5% was Waterfall. Uh, I always laugh a little bit when I look at the don't know number. 11% of survey respondents didn't know which methodology their organization was using. And 3.2% said that they were utilizing Kanban and other uh, made up, the, uh, rounded out the list with 4%. So to put that into perspective, let's take a look at the historical trend lines, if you will, that we've been capturing since 2012. So this particular bar chart looks at the historical methodology adoption rates, product development methodology adoption rates. You'll notice that Agile is in gray, Blended is in gold, Waterfalls in green, Kanban's in purple, and Lean is in a bluish tone. Uh, let's start by turning our attention to Blended. So if you look back in 2012, the large bar that towers over everything else at 52.5%, um, these Blended methodologies were by far the most dominant methodology in use in 2012. When you Turn your eye then to the right to 2013, you'll notice that you know those numbers had fallen off down to 43.42%. And in the concurrent years, you know, from 2014 and 2015, it bounced around a little bit, but has been pretty much you know flat uh, for all intents and purposes. I mean, if we wanted to round it, we could say 44% across the board. So uh, the blended numbers, while are they're still the most dominant product development methodology currently in use, it's pretty clear that they're neither growing nor shrinking and that they're remaining pretty constant year over year. Now the same can't be said really of waterfall or um, agile methodology. So let's turn our attention then to agile for a second, the gray bar. And if we once again start at 2012, you'll notice that back in 2012, less than 13% of survey respondents said that they were using an agile methodology. But when you look at 2013, you notice this exponential increase from 13% to 30.26% uh, that year you know, a big agile adoption um, year uh, where the numbers actually started to skyrocket. And so there was this exponential increase from 13% to 30%. In the following year, 2014, agile continued to grow at a pretty healthy rate, um, you know, still 10%, even though it's not exponential, up to 33.16. But you'll notice in 2015, we've seen the first decay in the Agile numbers down to 26%, so almost falling 7%. And conversely, let's take a look at Waterfall, and then I'll try to explain what I think is going on here. Um, but if you look at Waterfall, the green column in 2012, you'll notice it was 18% in 2012, fell down to 12.5% in 2013 fell yet again to 10.2% in 2014, but for the very first time, just like with Agile's decline, we see that waterfall actually increased in 2015. And then to round out the picture, um, you'll notice that the blue and the purple bars, Kanban and Lean, um, sort of round out the, the numbers, if you will. So lean in 2012 was about 6% of the total, and it decreased in 2013 to 2.6%, at which point we stopped actually tracking lean, and I'll explain why. Um, what we found was that there was confusion given this, the, um, the breadth of the survey respondents. Uh, some looked at um, 
uh, lean as being a lean startup, and others looked at it as lean sort of a cost reduction methodology, particularly in um, larger organizations. So there, there was an inherent confusion in terms of survey respondents answering that same question, given that it was the question was spanning all the various size of companies in terms of annual revenue. So in 2014, we decided to drop lean, given the confusion, um, and actually add Kanban into the mix. And as you can see, Kanban has incrementally increased from 2014 to 2015 from 2.5% to 3.2%. So what do we think is really going on here? I mean, it's pretty clear that blended methodologies remain dominant for a variety of reasons. Uh, there are organizational constraints that inhibit Agile being executed across the enterprise uh, effectively. So I think blended methodologies will continue, at least if I had a crystal ball, I'd project that they're going to continue to be the dominant methodology, particularly with what we saw this year where Agile fell off some uh, and actually waterfall increased. What we think is going on here is we think that some organizations have attempted to make the jump to Agile. Um, you know, sometimes going through blended, other times making a straight jump to Agile from a waterfall methodology. And we think that some organizations have started to revert back, um, largely due, we think, to organizational constraints, as I mentioned earlier, capital planning, annual planning processes, things along those lines that don't allow organizations to effectively utilize Agile to the extent that they might wish to. Um, and additionally, we've always said from the very beginning that there are certain types of organizations that will, waterfall will never go away uh, because there are certain types of organizations where having a regimented and disciplined process, for example, in highly regulated in where you know there's sufficient documentation and clarity in terms of all the steps that a regulatory agency can you know intuitively understand and follow and you know that we can provide the necessary documentation to support their requirements waterfall will never absolutely go away so th there will always be a percent but this is the very first time that we've actually seen a bounce in the waterfall numbers and uh, it'll be interesting to see both in the case of agile next year and waterfall, whether this is an aberration or this is a new trend, where there's some um, regression, if you will, in terms of adoption rates, with um, more organizations leaning in the direction of waterfall uh, and less in the direction of agile. As you can see, the blended numbers have remain the same. So it's really a push me, pull you between both waterfall and um, agile methodologies. So on to the next aspect of this, um, when we ask which methodology do respondents associate with increasing the profitability of their products, it's very interesting because you'll notice here <clears throat> that Agile and Scrum at 36% are actually the dominant response rate. So as we saw earlier, there's a large portion of organizations that are actually utilizing blended methodologies, but even those organizations seem to recognize that you know utilizing a, an Agile methodology uh, would actually be more beneficial in terms of the profitability of their product. So they're obviously doing it for some other reason. Notice that blended, which was 43% in the last slide in terms of where we are in 2015, um, it, that only 32% of survey respondents believe that blended is actually the best way to go when you're trying to increase the profitability of your product. Um, don't know at 18.1 was the next highest response, followed then by waterfall at 6%, Kanban at 4.6%, and other at 2.7%. So the bottom line is, while 26% of product teams say they use Agile, 36% view Agile as the best way to increase product profitability. So uh, we continue to believe that there's an underlying uh, riptide, if you will, that, that's trying to push people in the direction of Agile. And the question is, is you know, so there's clearly room for growth here. The question is whether organizational constraints will, will inhibit that from happening. So, I want to shift the lens a little bit and away from product development methodologies, adoption rates, and profitability, and talk a little bit about some other factors um, that came up in our uh, research this year uh, that impact product team performance. And the first one is job satisfaction levels. We asked a question about how satisfied individual survey respondents were with their jobs, and it was fascinating, actually. What we found, this is the very first time we asked this question, is that 63% of product team members are either currently satisfied or extremely satisfied with their jobs. 
um, we were actually expecting those numbers to be a little bit lower, so this really opened our eyes. And you'll notice also that another big chunk at about 25%, 24.5, say they are somewhat satisfied, and then 7% say they're dissatisfied but staying put. So they're probably keeping an eye on the market, looking for an opportunity, but not doing it actively, uh, more passively. And then only 5.1% said that they were actively looking to exit. But this actively looking to exit, in fact, actually has a very high impact on um, you know, organizations that turnover. So when we then drilled down into turnover's impact, what we found basically was that turnover was having either a pretty significant or moderate impact for a lot of organizations, even though the number is relatively low. In fact, 54% of organizations said that they were either experiencing um, you know, missing major deadlines or serious quality issues as a result of turnover, either on a significant or on a moderate basis, so those top two bars. Um, minor impact was occurring uh, in terms of organizations being able to meet their commitments at about a quarter of organizations. Um, almost 18% of organizations said that turnover had not increased and the impact was negative, negligible. And then finally, um, in only 3% of organizations was turnover perceived as beneficial in terms of resulting in improved performance. So 54% of survey respondents state that turnover has a negatively impacted their ability to be able to execute. A pretty significant number when we know that only 5% of, of survey respondents say they're active looking to make a change. So um, as we sort of segue our way into the findings from the 2015 study, one of the things I wanted to do was just put up some quick um, bullets on some of the key findings from our past studies for those of you who are interested. Um, so in 2013 we saw that we documented through our regression analysis the importance of an aligned strategy. So how strategy alignment between the executive team and the product team um, has a statistically significant impact on performance. Uh, also, we got into business unit leader engagement, so the more actively involved they are, the more likely it is that uh, they'll be better performance. Product team, product manager role definition, a lot of organizations don't define the role very effectively, so there, you know, there's a confusion between product marketing or marketing in the product manager role or where the product manager's role, whether it extends to encompass the product owner, whether it's a strategic role, how is this role defined? So those organizations that did a more effective job at defining the product manager role were more likely to be high performing. The importance of product launch, and this has a lot to do with having a single person that's accountable for the launch process. Onboarding product team members, doing it in an efficient way. Um, only 4% uh, in this year's, that year's survey responses said that they had a best practice on onboarding product team members. In fact, the dominant way of onboarding product team members was sink or swim, which is sort of a high risk, high reward way to do this and not very disciplined, but it continues to be the dominant way most organizations onboard product team members. In 2014, we started to look at product team culture. Uh, there were five sub-factors, one of which was the uh, incorporation of user experience professionals, where they emerged for the very first time in our regression analysis, acknowledging the critical relationship between product and project management, the ability to be able to have a smooth handoff between those two leadership roles came into play here, optimizing the product team's relationship with sales, and the burden of that really lies on the shoulders of the product team, understanding the sales cycle. Sadly, very few product teams actually understand their product sales cycle, something that I think we think um, de detrimentally impacts performance of product teams based on a regression analysis findings, and finally enhancing the relationship with marketing. And as I alluded to earlier, part of this has to do with clear definition between roles and responsibilities. So having sort of given you a quick overview of some of the 2013 and 2014 regression analysis findings, let's turn our eye towards the key findings for 2015. In fact, there are four that are in focus. And so what factors this year contribute to high performance in terms of our regression analysis? The first was strategic decision-making aptitude. Um, organizations that actually have this aptitude are more likely to be high-performing than those that don't. 
uh, and sadly not enough organizations do as I'll show you in the data, stand-up frequency. It turns out that the more frequent you, frequently you conduct stand-ups, the more likely you are to be uh, high performing. Quick problem recovery, so this comes down to nimbleness in terms of dealing with unforeseen issues and we'll talk about that for a minute. And finally, once again, user experience appeared for a second time in our regression analysis this year and it has to do with how user experience is used uh, within an organization. So let's start off by diving into our first uh, regression analysis factor, which is strategic decision making. And the question we asked in the survey uh, was, does your organization do an effective job at decision making in order for the product team to successfully develop products? And so we, um, we gave them the opportunity to basically say that they're good at the following. So are you know are you good at making and sticking with decisions in which areas? And what came back was that technical decisions at 50% were what the majority of survey respondents perceived their product teams and their organizations as being good at, followed by product requirements decisions. But look at strategic decisions at 37%. Um, once again, only a, roughly a third of organizations actually are effective at making and sticking with strategic decisions. And as our regression analysis shows, those organizations that actually have this competency tend to outperform their counterparts. So there's a key um, opportunity here for almost 63% of organizations to really start to put a little more emphasis on this area um, because it actually has a significant, it's a significant way to be able to differentiate yourself from the competition. And only a minority of organizations are effectively making and sticking with their strategic decisions. And then if we turn our eye to the right, you'll notice that go-to-market decisions and we struggle in all these areas are roughly the same response rates at about 30%. So our regression analysis shows that organizations with an aptitude for strategic decision making uh, and sticking with those decisions perform better, bottom line. So let's take a closer look at stand-up frequency. And as it turns out, frequency matters. When we probed the value of stand-ups um, in terms of the survey, here's what we found. 40% of organizations, almost 41, say that their stand-ups are effective but are not conducted on a regular basis. 22% say their stand-ups are effective, an effective cornerstone of our product development process and conducted daily. And then the following bar at 18.1% says the same thing except that the stand-ups are conducted regularly. Um, and then if we slide down to the gold bar here, we'll see that we do stand-ups regularly but they're ineffective at 11.4% and then 8% of organizations basically say that stand-ups are contentious and a waste of my product team's time. Uh, so what we found though in the regression analysis was that those organizations that um, it had a high frequency of conducting stand-ups were more likely to uh, be high performing than those that didn't. So these top two rows uh, where stand-ups are being conducted daily and regularly are re have a material impact and are highly correlated to high performance on product teams. So. The more frequently stand-ups are being held, it, in, it co correlates to the ultimate um, higher levels of performance on the product team. So in terms of our third regression analysis finder, this gets at quick problem recovery. In fact, the question we asked in the survey was, how does your company's culture react when unforeseen issues are encountered in the product development process? And what we see with the gold bar, the, the product, the, slice of the pie is that the majority of responses fall into we rally but it takes time before we can move past unforeseen issues with almost half of survey respondents falling into that uh, category. And then if we look to the right to the blue slice of the pie we see we quickly rally and move past unforeseen issues at 35 percent. The green slice of the pie says we hug, we hug we get hung up on unforeseen issues and may or may not get past them at 13%, and then 3% say we don't react well and rarely ever get past these issues. So um, one of the things that we see in the regression analysis is that the more nimble organizations are at overcoming unforeseen issues, the more effectively they perform. So those organizations in the 35.4% are higher performing organizations than all the rest in the database. So nimbleness matters when it comes to overcoming unforeseen issues. And 64% of organizations struggle with this challenge, once again, almost two-thirds of organizations. 
And finally, our fourth regression analysis factor this year had to do with user experience and its collaboration with product management. In fact, when you look here, you'll notice that UX uh, professionals tend to be heavily allocated towards the development of a product or the planning of a product, both of those response rates were in 60% range, uh, followed by testing of a product a little further downstream at 53%, and then the conception of a product at 51% approximately. Only a third of UX professionals are actively involved in product launch or in in-market iteration of a product, which is very interesting. And in fact, 14% of organizations said none of the above. So our data shows that um, active UX involvement in the product development process leads to better outcomes and so there's some there's some things that lie between the lines here. First of all, it, it appears that because of the scarcity of UX resources, that the majority of organizations are incorporating user experience professionals in the front end of the process, most likely with high value uh, new product initiatives or high value product initiatives overall where UX resources are, are incorporated from the very conception of the product all the way through the testing phase. And the other thing I would say is the scarcity of UX resources I think also becomes a, in, apparent when you look at in-market iteration of a product. I think most people would agree that a UX professional could add a lot of value when you're iterating a product, product as much as when you're developing a new product or at least you know, comparable to that level. And it's pretty clear to see that those resources are not extending downstream into in-market iterations of a product once it's been launched. And so I see great opportunities to extend UX's reach um, you know, further downstream in this particular aspect, which I think will happen over time. So as I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in downloading a copy of the study of product team performance from 2015, you can go to our website. Uh, this, this study is free. You just need to enter in some contact information and you'll be able to download it. Um, you can reach it. Uh, you can download a copy of it at www.actuationconsulting.com, that's A-C-T-U-A-T-I-O-N, consulting.com, and we'd love to have you, uh, you know, get a copy. A lot of the findings that we covered today, are all the findings that were incorporated in today's webcast are in the white paper, but there's probably about 50% more information beyond what we shared in today's webcast, and so uh, those of you who are interested, you know, feel free to download a copy. We'd love to have you. Uh, also participate in future studies if you're interested. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to contact us. My name is Greg Geraci. I'm the president, as Michael had said earlier, of Actuation Consulting. You can reach me at greg at actuationconsulting.com. I've also put my Twitter handle and LinkedIn handle up here as well as our uh, contact line. So feel free to reach out to us and our website is also listed here as well. So I want to take a second to thank Mike and Alok and the uh, GoTo group team for having provided me the opportunity to share our latest findings with you. They're a great group of folks and uh, appreciated the opportunity to work with them. Uh, I encourage you guys to you know, uh, download our study if time allows and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You know how to contact me. Once again, this is Greg Geraci signing off and thanks again to the GoTo group.